Hey there once again YouTube, my name is Ben Ferriolo and I'm an amateur seismologist who hopes to make a career out of monitoring volcanic and tectonic hazard areas. I even have my own website, you can find a link to it in the description box below right under my email address. It has a multitude of different seismic events and hundreds of plots for a bunch of different things. I even show you how to find seismic data, how to analyze it, how to read seismic plots, and much more. I pretty much teach you how to make everything that seems hard really easy because really what i'm doing is hard to figure out at first yes but it really is very easy guys it's so easy that i'm surprised other youtubers are not doing what i do very surprising well it seems to be snowing very hard at yellowstone right now but we still haven't even seen any snow here in seattle how sad so Right now is 12.28 p.m. Pacific Time, January 6th, 2019. My birthday is tomorrow, guys, and I'm going to be 26 years old. Woohoo! I'm turning into an oldie. If you saw my post last night, you would know that a very intriguing swarm broke out just to the northeast of Yellowstone Lake in a very odd location. The largest event has so far been reported as a magnitude 2.8. But how can that be when the largest event was almost twice the size as the magnitude 2.2? We will look at that in just a minute. I just want to look at a few other things just really fast. So we have definitely been seeing some interesting worldwide seismicity lately. It seems ever since the magnitude 7 in Alaska on November 30th, 2018. Is this it? Yep, that's it. The 7.0 in Alaska, which shook up the place like crazy. It seems there has been around a magnitude 7 striking the world once per week. Now, I thought this was very intriguing. This page here is set to the past two months for magnitude 6.4 and above. So all earthquakes 6.4 and above for the past two months are shown right here. As usual, we see nothing for the Cascadia subduction zone at all. That should change, because really, all of that pressure is not being relieved correctly, guys. It's got to be stuck or something. But this is not what I wanted to talk about. But really, check this out. Just real quick, let's go down. Ever since the 7.0 in Alaska on the 30th, the next 7.0 event was a 7.5 in New Caledonia about six days later on December 5th. The next 7.0 was about, hmm, interesting, six days later on December 11th. The next 7.0 was about, hmm, very interesting. This one was actually nine days later, so a little late, 7.3 in Russia. And then, let's see, the 20th, and then nine days later, again, we see a 7.0 in the Philippines. And then, let's see, about six or seven days later, it's not really considered a 7.0, but it was a 6.8 at 575.3 kilometers in depth. Wow. Wow, guys. I'm pretty sure. Let me go down. Yep, it is the, yes, it is the deepest, largest earthquake to occur in the past two months. 6.8 at 575.3 uh, kilometers in depth. That's very deep, guys. But notice again, I'm going to go back down and do it one more time. The 7.0, oh, excuse me, in Alaska hit, boom, November 30th. Let's look at about five to six days later, we see the 7.5 in New Caledonia. About six days later, we see the 7.1 in the south, in near Bristol Island in the South Sandwich Islands. And then about nine days later, we see the 7.3 in Russia. And then nine days later, we see the 7.0 in the Philippines. And then about six or seven days later, we see the 6.8 in Brazil. How is this possible, guys? We are seeing. A magnitude 7, I'm going to say probably magnitude 6.9 to 7.5 once per week. Literally, I mean, there are some larger earthquakes in the middle, like there's like a 6.6 .6 and stuff like that. But I'm talking about like the larger magnitude 7s. Why has it only been about once per week? Doesn't that seem a little too rhythmic? Personally, I've never seen anything that interesting. I thought that was very interesting. Here we are at isthisthingon.org slash Yellowstone. Now, I was not planning on doing a video today, but there was definitely some interesting activity at Yellowstone Caldera last night, guys. Remember how the most recent swarm at Yellowstone happened on December 31st, New Year's Eve, 2018? And how that event contained around 255 earthquakes within 5 hours and 35 minutes, but only 58 were reported? Well, I believe that recent swarm, which occurred about a week ago, has something to do with last night's swarm. The swarm I'm about to analyze was quite strong. So far, the largest event they say was a magnitude 2.8, but again, how can that be? 
The largest event was almost twice as strong as the Magnitude 2.2. So it must have been maybe, I'm going to say maybe 3.5? I'm going to say maybe a 3.7 at the complete maximum. But still, it was larger than a 2.8, I believe. But to me, magnitudes are not as important as what the waveforms and frequencies have to tell me. Let's analyze the fast-paced swarm. For the following analysis, I will use these stations here. YJC, right here. YPC, YSB, and Borehole 208. The swarm occurred pretty much right in the center of these four stations, so we'll get a good look at the event, that's for sure. Something to look at while I analyze the data is the frequencies of the earthquakes on neighboring stations. Sure, the closest station is showing mid-range frequencies, as you will see in a bit, but the frequencies, um, actually, you know, they weren't really mid-range frequencies. I'm going to say they were probably low to mid-range frequencies. They were definitely a lot lower. But the frequencies on neighboring stations seem to have been attenuated greatly, meaning they shrank and were thinned out over a short distance. For example, when a large global earthquake strikes the world, it can show on seismic stations all across the planet. However, the farther the signal travels, the more the frequencies drop. That is why teleseisms from distant global earthquakes cause some very low frequencies. But the frequencies from these earthquakes, though around 9 or 10 kilometers in depth, and striking at a maximum magnitude of possibly 3.5 to 3.7, dropped within a short amount of distance. So much so, that this almost looked like a complete low-frequency swarm, except on the closest seismic station, which is YJC. Also, these 10 or so earthquakes that occurred in about 10 minutes or so, we will figure that out in a second, struck in an odd location. Again, YJC, which is pretty much the closest station to the epicenter. This is an extremely odd location for a swarm, and since these were deeper than usual, and the frequencies were lower than usual, I think this signals a major change for the caldera. I personally believe a new round of uplift is approaching along with more swarming. The caldera has just been acting very odd lately, guys. And as you can see real quick, if you're ever wondering if a 3.1 struck Yellowstone, or if a 3.5, or even a 3.7, or even a 2.5, it will show like this. It will show on multiple surrounding stations. How could it not? Just think of that for a second. How could it not? That's like saying you throw a stone in a pond and ripples only go out to certain directions. No, when you throw a stone into a pond, the ripples go all the way around, guys, 360 degrees. It spreads out from the source. That is exactly, exactly how seismic events underground work, period. That, that's simple physics, guys. If a 3.1 earthquake was going to strike Yellowstone, it would show like this. Because this earthquake, the largest event, was around a 3.1 at the minimum. I think it's more like a 3.5, 3.7 at the maximum, remember? But it's definitely above 3.0, that's for sure. So use this as an example. This is a typical 3 at Yellowstone. Notice how it shows on so many surrounding stations miles away. Notice that? Let's go to MCID. So it occurred right up here, right? This is about 100 miles to the southwest. It still shows up right there, guys. So, just saying, if you see a 3.0 at Yellowstone, it's going to travel quite far. All right, so now here we are in the seismic program waves. The seismograms you are looking at were downloaded from IRIS, from stations Borehole 208, YJC, YPC, and YSB. You can clearly see the swarm last night right here. It started at about 529 UTC. Let's go to 529 real quick. All the way back, right with this event right here, which you can barely see, but we'll see that in just a second. Started at 529 UTC on January 6, 2018, or 2019, sorry, and ended at about 545 UTC. So a total of about 16 minutes or so. So let's check it out. Let's zoom in all the way real quick. Zoom out. Here's the first event right here. Notice how the frequencies were attenuated. A good amount uh, for some of the neighboring stations, which was interesting. So let's count how many events actually occurred. There's one. There's obviously two, three, four, five, obviously six, seven, eight, obviously, nine, ten. Yes, those are two separate earthquakes. So we have ten already. Let's see. Um, I'm gonna say eleven, but that was very tiny. 
12, 13. Let's see. Let's go back. 13. That's it pretty much, guys. Except maybe maybe 14. So maybe about 14 earthquakes within about, I'm going to say, 16 minutes or so. So that does not sound crazy, does it? No, that sounds really small. But that's not what concerns me the most. It's the characteristics of the events themselves. So again, about 14 earthquakes, with the largest most likely being around a 3.3 to 3.5, 3.7 at the absolute maximum. Very interesting, guys. I am very intrigued by this swarm, especially with the dominant low frequencies that it carried. So why don't we go check that out? So as you can see, this swarm was quite large, but did not contain that many events, probably only around 14 earthquakes or so. Again, with the largest being around a magnitude 3.5 to 3.7 at the maximum. As we will see in a second, these earthquakes had dominant low frequencies, but they are borderline low frequency events. Since dominant frequencies still remain below 5 hertz with weaker frequencies going barely beyond 14 hertz, I'm going to say this was not hydrothermal in nature. And we can obviously tell that it wasn't just a normal tectonic process. So could something be shifting under Yellowstone? Again, this is an extremely odd location for a swarm of this strength. Since YJC was the closest station to this event, I will use that station for the following analysis on swarm. I will also use borehole 208 at the end to show how the frequencies attenuated over a short distance. Here we are for the seismic program swarm. Now I have the data stream selected for YJC, the closest seismic station to this swarm. You can see it doesn't look too major. You can see a couple major earthquakes right here. Major as in we haven't seen these magnitudes much, especially in 2018, except for the earlier February 2018 swarm, which personally is not even, th those thousands of earthquakes that happened early in 2018, I think are not even close to as important as these few earthquakes right here. Ben, are you crazy? How could you say that? Well, it's because of the characteristics of the events, the waveforms themselves. So... We already figured out there are about 14 earthquakes or so within about 16 minutes or so, right? Let's real quick turn persistent rescale off. We got all that. Let's go through the waveforms real quick. Here's the first event right here. Let's see. Let's check out the dominant frequencies of this earthquake. Notice the lower frequencies. Check this out. Dominant frequencies. Log power off. All right. Now, I want you to keep in mind this peak right here. Sometimes it looks rounded, but right now it does have a sharp peak around, let's see, that's about 1.2 hertz. We do have higher frequencies for this earthquake. That's not what I want to look at, though. Let's go forward to the waveforms again. Here is the first earthquake that they said was a 2.2 right here. Let's go forward. Here's another one right here. A few more in the middle. Boom, and then we have another one and another one. But look at this. Look at the waveform oscillations, guys. Over here, they are not perfectly spaced. But the surface waves from this earthquake do have almost perfectly spaced waveforms. I thought that was very intriguing. Look at that, guys. Very interesting swarm. Pretty strong, but short, too, which really confuses me a little bit. Look at that. Okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to zoom all the way out. Here are all of the earthquakes. Doesn't seem like that many, right? Well, the characteristics of them are very intriguing. Let me zoom in. Notice how they have dominant low frequencies, but they do have weaker frequencies, not even going past 15 hertz. So they're definitely not high frequency earthquakes, that's for sure. They do have mid-range frequencies, again, but the dominant frequencies remain below remain below 3.2 hertz, with the strongest frequencies always being between 1 and 2 hertz. Let's go through. Boom. Here is the first earthquake. Notice the dominant frequencies below 4 hertz. So I don't know if this can really be, you know, I said this was a low-frequency swarm, but the frequencies are a little bit higher than what normal low-frequency earthquakes put out. They do have mid-range frequencies, but again, the dominant frequencies remain below 5 hertz almost the whole time. Notice how these stronger events had stronger lower frequencies. Notice how the weaker events had a little bit of the higher frequencies, but the stronger events had stronger lower frequencies, which I thought was very interesting. 
to me, this does not look like hydrothermal activity at all. Period. Look at that. Very interesting. And this straight spike that you see near 10 hertz, that is the background activity. Uh, I don't know what's causing it, but it looks synthetic in nature. Look at the background activity. Look, I thought this was some type of tremor, but I don't even know what the heck it is. It's too specific. Let me log power, because I always look for a low-frequency background tremor whenever there's a swarm. Always look at that. And I thought this was intriguing, but look at how perfect it is. Just completely perfect. Usually, harmonic or volcanic tremor would occur below 5 hertz, and it would not be perfect. It would be blotchy. It would go in and out. But this looks more like an actual signal is being processed through this seismic station. I don't know what that could be. I, I don't know. I'm just scratching my head because it makes no sense. Just real quick, let's go back and analyze these earthquakes one more time. There's the first event. There's the second. Let me zoom in a little more. There we go. Keep going. Keep going. Some strong surface waves. Here's the other earthquake. A few earthquakes in the middle. And then, boom, we see the largest event is this one right here, which I believe is either a 3.3 to 3.5, with 3.7 at the maximum, which did have strong surface waves. And from what I could see for the reported earthquakes, which I'll show in just a second, they are, so far they're only reporting two, I believe. It looked like that as time went on, these became more shallow. And look at how fast they are occurring, guys. Look at how fast. This whole burst in seismicity was only within the main burst. I mean, of course, there are other earthquakes, but the main burst, about 535 to 540, no more than 15 minutes long. The main burst right here, let's see, 3830, 39, that's only in what, like a few minutes? That's only within like two or three minutes maximum. Look at that. So this was definitely a rapid-fire swarm. I will show the location of the swarm in just a second. Let's look at the dominant frequencies of the entire swarm. Again, dominant low frequencies. Check that out. And frequencies drop at about 4.2 hertz. So it does remain below 5 hertz. But again, it does have weaker frequencies going beyond that just a little bit. So it's a borderline low-frequency event. Like it's just right on the border of whether it's not or whether it is. Let's shut this off real quick and go to borehole 208. I just want to show you this. Okay, so borehole 208, let me turn persistent rescale off as usual. Let me pan this down. Okay, so borehole 208 is sort of distant from this event, yes. But we should see much higher frequencies than what we are seeing on borehole 208. Check this out. Actually, first, why don't we use the spectrogram first? Notice I first saw this, and I thought it was an actual low-frequency tremor or earthquake, and so I was very intrigued, kept an eye on it, and boom, there was another event. You could see some barely weaker frequencies, not even going past 15 hertz really at all much. Let's go to the dominant frequencies. Dominant frequencies remaining below 2 hertz, and it drops at about 2.9 hertz. That's about 1.0 to 1.5 hertz dropping within only, what, like 10 miles or so? That's a lot of frequency to drop over a short distance, guys. I, I thought that was very intriguing. I don't know why the frequencies dropped. Maybe it's because they were really deep. I mean, they weren't really deep, but they are deeper than what we have seen as of late. Let's go to the waveforms. Look at this. I know this station's far away from the swarm, not too far, but still... Look at these perfect waveform oscillations. Guys, check this out. Look at that. My goodness, that's like almost near perfect. And zoom in. Very interesting earthquake. Very interesting. Now, if you were just to look at Borehole 208, you'd say that that's, yeah, definitely a low-frequency event. And it's quite strong, too. Another event. There's the second event right there. And boom. Right before it, we have that one. And here is the one that I believe was a 3.3 to 3.5. Dominant low frequencies, of course, because it is a little bit farther away. Look at that. Let's go to the spectral plot real quick. Again, remaining below 2 hertz. And this time drops at about 3.5 hertz. And there's a weird peak at 0 0.8 hertz, which I thought was very interesting right there. Okay, so let's go forward. Let's keep going. Let's go forward to this one. So again, I'm just showing you this just to show you how the frequencies dropped. Not too crazy, but they did drop more than I thought it could over a short distance. 
because it's Borhol 208 is only what like 10 15 miles maximum to the southwest of this event so I don't know after this swarm there were a few other earthquakes and their frequencies did drop but we also saw this I believe this was a teleseism I believe because check out the dominant frequencies maybe not maybe not I do not believe this was a teleseism. The frequencies are too high. Look at that. Dominant frequencies at 1.3 hertz and 1.1 hertz. Let's go back. Okay. Well, it appears and looks like a teleseism. The waveforms are identical to teleseisms, but I don't know. So that's very interesting. But that's not really what I wanted to look at. I wanted to look at some of these. These ones did not come from the YJC area. These came from Yellowstone Lake itself because Borehole 208 saw these following earthquakes stronger than any other station. And they were pretty weak, yes. But still, they had dominant low frequencies. Check this out. Let me log power back on. Notice the dominant low frequencies. There's another one down here too with dominant low frequencies as well that YJC was not showing. So this was coming from Yellowstone Lake itself. Let's take a look at the waveforms one more time. There's one. Here's another one going to about 400 amplitude count. Definitely looks like a low frequency event to me. Another one. And then there's one more right here. Let's check out the spectral plot just to see the dominant frequencies of these events. Below 2 hertz with it dropping at about 2.6 hertz. Low frequency events. Look at that. Background noise, background noise, background noise. Boom. Background noise. Boom. And remaining below 2 hertz, really. Look at that. So we did have a swarm last night at Yellowstone, guys. It did not last that long. There weren't that many earthquakes, but the magnitudes were very impressive, guys. Very impressive. And we have had another short burst in low-frequency seismicity near Yellowstone Lake, but they're very, very weak. Notice these little dots down here. These are all little tiny low-frequency events from the lake. Look, 40 amplitude count. That is like, that's weak. Very small. That's like the smallest of the small. You can't get smaller than that. Except this one went to 400 amplitude count. This one went to 200. This one went to about 100. So, what is going on at Yellowstone, guys? Something is definitely starting to take place under the caldera, but what is changing? Again, let's just look at the swarm again one more time. It had, near the epicenter had dominant mid-range frequencies, and it occurred right around 9 to 10 kilometers in depth, getting shallower as the swarm progressed. Again, 14 earthquakes in about 16 minutes or so. Does not sound like that crazy. The largest mid-range frequency event was, again, most likely around 3.3, 3.5, 3 3.7 at the maximum. But it definitely looks like this was not hydrothermal in nature, guys. It just, to me, I, I highly doubt it. I mean, we can already knock off tectonic activity off the list, pretty much, because tectonic activity would not cause waveform oscillations and waveform characteristics such as these. Just wouldn't happen. So something else is going on at Yellowstone. Could it be connected to the December 31st earthquake swarm? So the burst in seismicity to the north-northeast of Yellowstone Lake was very intriguing. Again, so far they are only reporting two of them when we clearly saw more than two. See, only two of them were reported. The first one, again, was a magnitude 2.2. And they say, let's see real quick. This was at 538 at the 42 second mark. 538, I'm going to turn on YGC, 538 at the 42 second mark. Yeah, that's the largest event. Okay, so they say, okay, check this out. Notice how this is so much obviously much more smaller than this, right? Look at the amplitude count. This goes barely beyond 20,000. This one goes well beyond 32,000. Probably, I'm going to say maybe to about 40,000. So that means this one was pretty much about half the strength as this one right here. So that means this one, which was reported as a 2.2, is half the strength as this one, meaning this had to have been around 3.3 to 3.5. I, I, even if it's shallower and closer to the station, it should be above 3.0, definitely. Definitely above 3.0. This is the second one that they are reporting. They're only reporting two out of the obvious many other earthquakes that I don't know why they're not reporting. I don't know why. 
Maybe it's because the lapse in appropriations due to the government shutdown, but that doesn't make sense because uh, most of the seismicity is monitored by the University of Utah, which is not completely funded by the government. You know what I'm saying? So they should be able to report all of these. I don't know. Maybe they will in the coming days because I think it's Sunday today, right? Maybe they have a day off. I don't know. But again, this was the largest event of the swarm, which was almost twice as the size of the 2.2, and they are saying it's a 2.8. What? Hey, very interesting. Look at this. They're saying the 2.2, which was half the size of the 2.8. The 2.2 was at 9.1 kilometers in depth, and the largest event of the swarm, they're saying, was a 2.8 at 7.7 .7 kilometers in depth. This just popped up. This wasn't there just a bit ago. Looks like someone reported feeling this earthquake. Yes, one person reported feeling it. Come on. Okay, let's click the map. Let's see where this person was. Aha, up here in Bozeman. That makes sense. So someone 118 kilometers away felt this swarm. This was a strong but short swarm at Yellowstone, guys. And I think something is changing for the caldera. I don't know what. But the, the rapid-fire swarms at Yellowstone have been increasing greatly ever since the end of 2017 and the beginning of 2018, over a year ago. I don't know what's going on. I think another uplift, another round of uplift, excuse me, is going to occur soon. But these earthquakes reportedly did occur deeper than what we have been seeing lately. What is going on? And again, as the swarm progressed, it got shallower and shallower, coming from, I believe, the magma chamber. Since it was heading, let's see. Oh, it was heading the other way. Okay, so the swarm seemed to have been heading down this way from around 10 to 9 kilometers in depth, getting shallower as it reached the lake. Very intriguing. I do not even think hydrothermal activity would cause that. I don't know. I'm going to analyze this a lot more in detail tonight uh, when I have some more time because I got some stuff I got to do today. Uh, so why do you think... This swarm even appeared in this area, which was a strange location for a swarm. Also, did this occur because of the energetic December 31st, 2018 New Year's Eve swarm? Maybe. I will keep an eye on this closely. More swarming is approaching, I believe. Remember, swarms are the number one thing to keep an eye on at any volcano. That and also ground deformation, too. Here we are at volcanoes.usgs.gov. I just want to show you something. Here's, I believe, the past month of seismicity, about 103 earthquakes or so. A little bit over that. Remember, you can add about over 100 to that count because, remember, they're only reporting 58 for this swarm down here, even though there's around 255. So about 100 to 200 more on the count you can add. But here this shows some of the rapid-fire swarms that we were seeing at Yellowstone at West Thumb Lake which have been increasing the past few years exponentially, actually. 2018 has seen more rapid-fire swarms west of Thumb Lake than any other year on record. Yes. Then we have this swarm up here on New Year's Eve in this direction. Almost looked like a dike uh, opening was starting to occur. It really did look like there's a dike intrusion starting to form here, but it calmed, thank God. Now up here, let me zoom out real quick. This is the caldera boundary. Notice you can, even without this line right here, you can see the imprint right here where the ground sank and collapsed and erupted a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Look at this, right outside the caldera boundary, again to the north, northeast of Yellowstone Lake, just south of Amethyst Mountain, near Mirror Pla Plateau, excuse me, and also just to the east of Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. That is an odd, odd, odd location for a swarm guys especially with these magnitudes it's just I, i'm really scratching my head as to why that would even occur in that area i would expect stuff like this to be occurring at yellowstone lake this is far to the north northeast just want to show you guys that let's look at the current uplift charts real quick i know i already showed these in the volcano update that i uploaded recently but i think there's another data stream added at the end Looks like there is both subsidence and uplift occurring. It looks like it's going up and down, up and down, up and down, breathing really quickly. Not too big, but very confusing. Remember, you can see two uplift sequences since 2005. The one since 2005 peaked uh, just after 2009, which is just after the dike intrusion of Yellowstone Lake. The dike intrusion of Yellowstone Lake occurred right 
in this spot right here. After that happened, it started to go down, go down, go down. Right at 2014, there was another spike in uplift, and we saw a bunch of low-frequency activity. It was starting to definitely get concerning once again. But look at this. Boom. Subsidence. That means the ground is slowly sinking instead of rising. But that doesn't mean not, something's not going to happen, guys. Let's go all the way over. It has not been this low since 2007 but i believe it is going to start back up once again remember in previous updates i thought the ground was starting to move north well it is now and also we are starting to see an increase in activity north of yellowstone lake so could this be related to the increase in seismicity i think so i definitely think so let's look at wlwy again you can see the two uplift and subsidence patterns Remember, peaking between 2009 and 2011, went down, peaked again, and then it's been going down pretty much ever since with a few bumps here and there, but it cannot go down all the way for too long, guys. If you look at the previous year patterns, the previous patterns of GPS deformation that they have been recording on their instruments, it definitely will not go down for much longer, guys. It's... It can only go down so much because there's so much magma down there. So it will, the uplift sequence will start again soon. I don't know when. I'm not a fortune teller. I can't tell you that because, you know, I don't have a looking glass that can look inside the caldera. That would be kind of cool. But it looks like uplift maybe starting again. I don't know. It's very confusing right at the end of the data stream. Look at that. It's just, I don't know. We'll have to keep a very, very, very close eye on this. I'm definitely going to keep a close eye on that. That's for sure. Let's go to HVWY real quick. Eh, not much of a change. It's not showing uplift or subsidence. So I'm thinking something is definitely in the process of changing. That's for sure. Again, you can see a lot more uplift and subsidence right there. Let's see, January 4th. Yep, so they still have only reported two of the events. Very interesting. I believe, again, another round of uplift is starting. More swarming could be approaching, if I am correct. And yeah, it could be starting back up again, guys. And here we are at the old faithful webcam in the Upper Geyser Basin. That burst in seismicity last night was extremely interesting. They contained dominant low frequencies and occurred larger and deeper than what we have seen recently. Also, the swarm progressed from the north heading down to the southwest while getting shallower, which to me seems like something was trying to break free, but it obviously never did. I believe another round of uplift could be approaching along with more swarming, but of course, I have been wrong about that before. I've been wrong about a lot of things, but guess what? In a way, I like being wrong sometimes, because if I was always right, how would I ever learn? <laughs> now, why is the caldera acting so weird the past few months? Ever since the beginning of 2018, over a year ago, rapid-fire swarms near West Thumb and Yellowstone Lakes have been increasing. However, at the end of 2018, it seemed that activity shifted. What if we start to see rapid-fire swarms up near the Amethyst Mountain area where last night's swarm occurred? That would be extremely, extremely interesting. Now, Amethyst Mountain resides just a couple miles north of where last night's swarm occurred. Remember, the magma chamber and even the deeper, larger magma reservoir are a good few miles deep at the least. This shows that just because something occurred outside the caldera boundary doesn't mean it is not connected to magmatic processes in the magma chamber and reservoir. Anything at Yellowstone can be connected and have deep roots in magmatic processes. Even tectonic and hydrothermal activity can be caused by magma itself. That is why magnitudes are not the most important, and also the quantities at times. It is the characteristics of the events themselves and of their waveforms that you need to let speak for themselves. Yellowstone is an extremely dynamic and ever-changing place. However, I believe the recent swarming does signal a big change for the caldera. I don't know yet what that change could be, but I will keep a close eye on the caldera. I hope you all enjoy my videos, and please go check out my website if you haven't already. I'm still actively updating it with new content, so don't forget to check all the pages. A link is below in the description box right under my email address. I will be back soon, even sooner if activity changes. God bless, and remember the truth is considered hater fear to those who hater fear the truth. Be safe guys, Ben Ferriolo signing off.